One smoggy day in industrial London in 1856, a chemistry student named William Henry Perkin sat tinkering in his homemade laboratory. He was trying to create quinine, the only known cure to malaria. Perkin poured various substances into his beaker, slowly morphing and refining the chemicals inside. But when he looked down at his creation, he saw an ugly, dark sludge. Another failed attempt, he thought. He poured in some alcohol to break down the sludge so he could dispose of it. But as the alcohol made contact, it released a beautiful purple hue, richer and more colorful than anything he had ever seen. Within just a few years, Perkins' discovery would conquer the world. Deemed mauve or mauve, this new color would take over the fashion industry, make food look more appetizing, and enable stunning advances in medicine. This is The Light Bulb Moment, a Cheddar and Curiosity Stream original series. But Mauve's story doesn't begin with Perkin. It actually begins with an ancient disease still plaguing the British Empire in the early 1800s, malaria. The disease was running rampant in many of Britain's tropical colonies. Outbreaks could hamstring colonial administrators and soldiers. They also struck local populations. In India alone, malaria killed about two million people per year. Back then, scientists only had a very rudimentary understanding of how the disease worked. Today, we know malaria is caused by a microscopic parasite that infects red blood cells, deforming them. It hitches a ride from victim to victim when a mosquito drinks infected blood. But in the 1850s, patterns of infection baffled doctors. They had one lifeline though, bark from a mysterious tree native only to South America. Back in the 1600s, Spanish Jesuit missionaries had learned of the tree's abilities to cure malaria from indigenous peoples in Peru. In the 1630s, the Spanish took the bark back to Europe where it eventually became a common treatment for malaria that was still endemic to parts of England, Holland, Spain, Italy, and Russia well into the 1800s. As Europe continued to expand its colonial reach, the demand for the bark went way up. And with such a finite supply, so did the price. In 1820, two French chemists were able to identify the active ingredient in the bark that cured malaria. It was quinine. By 1852, the British in India were spending a combined 132,000 pounds per year on cinchona bark and pure quinine the equivalent of $24 million today. The British Army in India alone would need 750 tons of bark, and that $24 million was getting them nowhere near enough. Back in London, a prolific chemist named August Wilhelm von Hoffmann at the Royal College figured he might have an answer. Maybe, he thought, he could find a way to synthesize artificial quinine. Hoffman believed he had zeroed in on the perfect, cheap, raw material for making quinine. All of the street lamps all over London and some houses were lit by gas that had been synthesized from coal. And a byproduct of this was something called coal tar. It was a waste product. You had this junk and this black gunk and nobody really knew what to do with it. But that byproduct contained many of the elements in quinine. All Hoffman needed was the right recipe to rearrange those elements into life-saving malaria medicine. In particular, he thought a chemical easily refined from this coal tar called aniline might be the best place to start. Hoffman got some of his most promising students working on this, testing as many reactions as they could think of. And one of them, his protege, was William Henry Perkin. So Perkin, meanwhile, had already demonstrated his tenacity and his great curiosity by setting up a private laboratory at his parents' home in the East End of London. So naturally, when Perkin went home for Easter break, he kept experimenting, hoping he might be the one to discover this chemistry recipe for his mentor. But when Perkin instead became entranced with the rich purple color he had synthesized in his beaker in 1856, he knew he had stumbled on something else entirely. He bought some silk 
and has succeeded in dyeing this broad silk fabric a bright color of purple. Perkin then sent his bright silk cloth off to a dye works in Scotland to see how it paired up against their materials. Robert Puller, who ran the dye works, mailed a glowing reply, exclaiming, I enclose you patterns of the best lilac we have on cotton. It does not stand the test that yours does and fades. By the early 19th century, Paris was already coalescing around the luxury industries, fine dressmakers and fine hat makers and fine leather workers. But it was the great uh, textile centers in Mulhouse and Lyon that began to experiment with different ways to synthesize this color, this mauve color. France's elegant and youthful Empress Eugenie, the wife of Emperor Napoleon III, fixated on this mauve purple as one of her favorite new colors. The wife of Napoleon III uh, was a Spanish beauty who had mauve-colored eyes. And so when early French mauves became available, she started to wear this color because she thought it matched her eyes. Then, Perkin got another big break. But in Britain, the important moment came in 1858 when Princess Victoria, the daughter of Queen Victoria, got married. And at that wedding, Queen Victoria stole the show because she wore a beautiful mauve gown. It became a sensation. And so British women who were royal followers started to wear this new color mauve. Queen Victoria's dress most likely came from France and was dyed with those natural mauve pigments. Still, the public became obsessed with the color and orders to Perkins factory for his high quality, low cost mauve dyes exploded. The ladies would wear dresses made from silks made of the new mauve color. And those who couldn't afford mauve silks would accent themselves with the new mauve color. So if you didn't have a mauve gown, you could still participate as a lady of fashion in the latest trend by taking your hat and you could buy some mauve feathers, some mauve cloth flowers or paper flowers and put them on your hat. You could take your pair of gloves and you could add mauve buttons. You could take an older gown that maybe was pale pink or maybe was calico and you could put mauve trim or mauve buttons all over. So in the end, if you did this, you'd look like you were spotted because you'd have bits and bobs of mauve all over you and you'd have the mauve measles, as it was called. But Perkin eventually began to lose interest in the dye industry. In 1873, at 35 years old, Perkin decided to sell his company. Retirement treated Perkin well. He built his dream house, raised a family, and got back to his first love, lab research. He published over 60 scientific papers after retiring, investigating everything from the molecular architecture of various compounds to magnetic rotary power, combustion, and synthesizing more artificial smells. In 1906, as part of the celebration of the 50th anniversary of discovering mauve, the King of England, Edward VII, knighted Perkin. The American Society of Chemical Industry also honored him by creating the Perkin Medal, inviting Perkin to the U.S. amidst much fanfare for a whistle-stop goodwill tour. The Perkin Medal survives to this day and still marks one of the highest honors of achievement in industrial chemistry. The award reflects not just what Perkin had discovered, but all the applications his dyes had taken on as they seeped into other industries and fields. The dyes found their way into food. Meat producers used them to add savory colors to their sausages. Confectionaries used them in baked goods, and industrial canners even put them in jams. Beauty companies also jumped on board, enticing women to use them to dye their gray hairs but they found their most notable second life in biology and medicine. 
In the 1860s, just as the first wave of mauve mania was coming to a close in England and France, it was hitting the field of biology. A scientist named Paul Ehrlich pioneered using aniline dyes in studying the microscopic makeup of our bodies and the pathogens that infect us. Ehrlich and many of his contemporaries would stain cell tissue with these various synthetic dyes and then observe the stained tissue under microscopes. These methods helped identify many aspects of cell anatomy, including the nucleic acid that makes up DNA and chromosomes. It also helped identify the microscopic pathogens causing tuberculosis and cholera. Ehrlich even used the dyes to pioneer the groundwork for a cancer-fighting technology. He was originally looking to treat other conditions like malaria, but he came up with the idea of synthesizing chemicals that would find and destroy a specific type of cell in the body. In 1909, Ehrlich used the concept to create a cure for syphilis, naming it chemotherapy. Later, doctors drew on Ehrlich's work to develop the chemotherapy we use today for cancer treatment. From hospitals to food aisles, threads of Perkins' legacy are woven into the fabric of our lives. Countless original thinkers have built off of and refined Perkins' discovery, first creating a multiplicity of colors, then expanding the use of those synthetic colors to everything from perfumes to paint, hair dyes, food coloring, biology, and medical treatments. In other words, Perkins' light bulb moment is sort of like one little bulb in a giant Times Square sign. It lights up with hundreds, even thousands of others to create an awe-inspiring display. And once you see it, you lose track of that one little bulb that started it all. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe, and don't forget to hit the bell for notifications. You can watch full 22-minute episodes every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern on Cheddar's live network or anytime on CuriosityStream.